You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the Rand Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from Rand's latest research and commentary. It's March 17th. Fatal overdoses in the United States have increased steadily in recent years, largely because of the proliferation of illicit synthetic opioids such as fentanyl. Early estimates from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention suggest that more than 75,000 people died from opioid-related overdoses between September 2021 and August 2022. But as heartbreaking as drug fatalities are, they aren't the only negative outcomes linked to opioid use. People struggling with addiction experience quality of life issues and a slew of physical and mental health consequences. They aren't the only ones who suffer, either. An individual's substance use and related behaviors can significantly affect their family, friends, employer, and community. Having a loved one with addiction can also have substantial psychological, physical, and financial costs. The crisis is complex, but one thing is clear. America's opioid problem requires an urgent, comprehensive response. In a sweeping report released this week, RAND researchers recommend moving away from the siloed thinking that is traditionally used to tackle this issue. Instead, adopting an ecosystem approach could help significantly reduce opioid addiction, overdose, and other harms. People who use opioids and their families are at the center of RAND's ecosystem concept. The outer components of the crisis are 10 related systems, agencies, and sectors— They include medical care and first responders, the criminal legal system, education, and employment. This framework is meant to help federal, state, and local policymakers better understand the dynamics of many complex problems that involve opioids and explore innovative and evidence-based solutions. Continuing to treat fentanyl and other synthetic opioids just like previous drug problems will likely be insufficient and may condemn thousands more to early deaths says Rand's Bo Kilmer, co-editor of the report. We needed this response years ago, he says, but there's still time to get it right and save lives. You can learn more about this project on rand.org slash opioid ecosystem. There, you'll find the full report, which, as a sign of just how thorough it is, stands at more than 600 pages. You can also read a short summary of the report that includes one family's deeply personal story about opioid use disorder, and check out an interactive tool we developed for policymakers. Last week, the decidedly modern Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB, succumbed to a very old problem, a bank run. America saw its first bank run in 1819, and they've been happening ever since. SVB's failure, however, was different in one key way. It happened really fast. In fact, thanks to a mixture of technology and quick-spreading beliefs, SVB went under in just 48 hours. This is a troubling trend, says Rand's Jonathan Welburn. When viral posts, retweets, and shares about a bank's losses accelerate a financial collapse, regulators lose critical time to negotiate. Further, the spread of information on social media can shift markets in ways that are divorced from fundamentals. We may be facing a new era of viral financial panic, Wellburn says. Quote, the next crisis, and there will be a next crisis, could take mere hours. On Tuesday, a Russian fighter jet struck the propeller of a U.S. surveillance drone over the Black Sea. This led the U.S. to take down the uncrewed aircraft. What was Russia trying to do exactly? Well, according to Rand Samuel Cherub, the collision may have been an accident, but there's no question that Russia was attempting to either disable the drone or force it to change course. The point of an action like this, he said, is to raise the cost of flying drones over the Black Sea and inject a question mark over whether the U.S. should be doing this in the future. Cherup was the lead author on a RAND report published last year that examined Russia's history of such behavior, defined as coercive signaling. 
Notably, in their review of past incidents of coercive signaling by Moscow, Cherup and co-authors identified a few previously reported Russian intercepts of U.S. drones. Overall, the report's findings bear out what we saw with the incident this week. Much of Moscow's assertive, dangerous, or unsafe actions appear to be directed at shaping specific patterns of ongoing U.S. or allied behavior. And these behaviors are almost by definition responsive, not proactive. Considering the potential for future incidents, Cherup described how a worst-case scenario of Russian signaling gone wrong might play out. With the war in Ukraine grinding on, the Russian military is under high stress right now. This could lead Russia to do things that force a response from either the U.S. or its allies, he says. And while neither Russia nor NATO member states, including the U.S., want to go to war with one another, they're operating in such close proximity that the chance for inadvertent episodes to escalate out of control is much greater than it would be in peacetime. So the question is, will cooler heads always prevail? Production of the world's highest-end semiconductors exists almost entirely in Taiwan. Without them, hundreds of millions of people would be denied access to cutting-edge healthcare equipment, suffer from decreased work productivity, and lose social connectivity. A new RAND study looks at Taiwan's semiconductor dominance, as well as how potential Chinese action against Taiwan might affect the microchip supply chain and, in turn, the U.S., its allies and partners, and the global economy. Overall, the study shows that there are generally no good short-term options for responding to a disruption to the semiconductor supply chain that would result if China annexed or invaded Taiwan. Further, taking steps to support any Taiwanese resistance efforts against China could lead to broad and lengthy economic turbulence that would be politically unsustainable. The bottom line The U.S. should make an immediate and concerted effort to reduce the concentration of semiconductor production in Taiwan. The security pact between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the U.S., known as AUKUS, made news this week as President Joe Biden appeared with his Australian and British counterparts to announce a deal that will bring Australia a new fleet of nuclear-powered submarines. This move is part of Australia's strategy to project power beyond its shores. But according to RAND experts, Australia's approach, known as impactful projection, fails to consider the strategic calculus of nearby Southeast Asian nations, such as Singapore and Indonesia. More specifically, it relies on an assumption that if conflict were to occur, say with China, then other countries in the region will simply acquiesce to Australia's decisions, rather than invoke neutrality. And if countries in the region did invoke neutrality in a conflict, our experts say that Australian policymakers wouldn't just be surprised, they would be unaware of the implications. Quote, there is a danger of Australia walking into the mother of all strategic shocks if the core geopolitical assumptions underpinning its defense planning are suddenly shown to be flawed. For this reason, Australia may be wise to seek impactful engagement before seeking impactful projection, they say. That's it for today's episode. You can learn more about the topics we discussed in the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We'll see you next week. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis.